Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you decided to join us. Our guests today are Brian Kutzinger and Louis Wane. Brian is Assistant Professor of Economics at Angelo State University, and Louis is an Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Texas, El Paso. They join us today to discuss the French Revolution, its public finances, its bout with hyperinflation, and finally, the implications of this experience for macroeconomic theory today. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Well, it's great to have you guys on. Now, Brian, you are a veteran of the show. You've been on before. We had a fun conversation on the seniorage in the Civil War South paper that you wrote. Really interesting to learn that the South did not uh, optimize its seniorage flows because there's two different parties, had different views on, on maximizing seniorage. We talked about the seniorage Laffer curve. Uh, a lot of fascinating stuff we may bring up again as we discuss your work. And I have you two on because you just published a paper in the European Economic Review. Congratulations. That's that's quite an accomplishment in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. The paper itself is super fascinating, and it's titled, Assignates or Death, the Politics and Dynamics of Hyperinflation in Revolutionary France. So great paper. We'll provide a link to it, and I'll look forward to, to hearing more about it. But let me begin with a very simple question. What was the motivation behind this paper? As you mentioned in your introduction, one of the ideas that fascinated me on the Civil War side was the role that politics plays in determining uh, monetary policy, whether that is monetary policy in a modern context or historically where you don't have independent central banks, you have legislatures uh, making decisions about monetary policy. And we know from monetary and macro theory that the future path of policy, the future path of monetary policy has effects today. And that path is ultimately a decision or, or up to public choice or collective choice. So if we want to get a broader understanding of these factors, we need to incorporate politics into our analysis of, say, hyperinflation uh, and whatnot. And so Louis and I were in graduate school at the same time when I published that earlier paper. Louis obviously was very interested in the French Revolution. And so we decided to collaborate forces here uh, with our co-author, Josh Ingber, and start um, applying some of the same uh, lessons that I learned in writing that paper on the Civil War to the French experience with hyperinflation. Louis, you want to add anything to that? Yes. You know, I, I had been writing a paper on the Bank of France and I knew quite a bit about the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so it was only natural talking to Brian. We were in the same office in the Hayek program uh, and Mercatus. And so naturally, we, we started working together. It was it was a quite long process. At first, we, we didn't necessarily know what we were looking at. And, and then it, it kind of clicked uh, when we realized that we'll talk more about it, but like when the structural breaks in the demand for money were really related to specific political events during the French Revolution that were quite significant. Uh, and so that's when the, the paper took shape. And listeners, if you can't tell from Louis' accent, you are a Frenchman, so you bring a, a great perspective to this paper that, unfortunately, Brian cannot bring as an American. So uh, a great comparative advantage both ways. So let's talk about the French Revolution, kind of lay the groundwork for this paper, because a lot of people like myself in America probably don't have the best understanding or, or command of the history of the French Revolution. And, you know, if you asked me, what, what would I say? I'd say 1789 to 1799. I know the storming of the Bastille. I mean, I remember that from high school history, <laughs> you know, a phrase that we see in memes, storm of the Bastille. We talk about the reign of terror. That's pretty well known. Uh, the beheading of Marie Antoinette. But but how do you, would you characterize it? What What was the French Revolution what caused it? What's the broader historical context surrounding it? Well, so since we are on macro musings, the French Revolution was, first of all, a financial financial crisis, uh, a debt crisis. Around 1788, the French crown was completely bankrupt or close to completely bankrupt. 50% of government spending were, was going just to repaying the debt. And the king was unable to enact new taxes because you had strong oppositions from the parliaments, which were judicial institutions in Ancien Regime France. 
curiously, those parliaments were aristocratic and they were really the first one to sort of kind of rebel against the crown. And so the only recourse the king had was to call what was called the estate general, which represented the free estates of the realm. The first estate, which is the clergy, the second, which is the aristocracy, and the third, which is the third estate, the rest of the population, which is about 98% of the population. And this institution had not been called in more than 150 years. So it was really unprecedented. And the goal was to try to solve that financial crisis. Uh, so the uh, finance ministers of the time, Jacques Necker, who was a Swiss banker, just gave a speech and said, like, look, uh, if we don't do something, we are in trouble. We will go bankrupt. But you had so much conflict between the different interest groups of that uh, estate general that nothing was getting done. If you will, you have like a war of attrition between interest groups where each wants a fiscal cost of, you know, the reform to be borne by the other group. And in the end, the, the interest group that loses is the clergy because it was the most, the weakest interest group. You had a lot of dissension between the high clergy and the low clergy. And for that reason, they bore most of the cost of fiscal reform in the sense that assets of the clergy were nationalized. And when we say this, we need to realize that the clergy was by far the largest owner of land in France. It was about 10%, a bit less than 10% of French land that was owned by the church. So then they nationalized all of this land, but they had a lot of payments that were due immediately and they could not do them in time. Tax revenue had completely collapsed because you have pretty much chaos with the beginning of the French Revolution. And so they have, they have to find a way to pay the creditors. And one way they do this is to create the assignats. Now, in a way, the French Revolution, a lot of themes that we have today, we have in the French Revolution. For instance, there was this plan to create a sort of an independent central bank with what was called the caisse d'escompte, which was a bank of issue in Paris. But very quickly, that didn't prevail because uh, the members of the National Assembly thought the members of the caisse d'escompte were members of the Ancien Regime. They would support the king and the aristocracy and the old regime. And for that reason, they did not go with an independent central bank. Some offers at the time, some politicians were like, look, Maybe that's a bad idea for the parliament to be in charge of monetary policy directly, but that's what they went with. So the, the parliament was directly in charge of printing money, basically. So I, I'm, I'm tr trying to not be too lengthy because, of course, the French Revolution is, uh, you know, a long period. So some say it's like starts in uh, 89 and goes to basically the end of the Napoleonic area. But you have a lot of experiments at the time. France had a pretty strong distaste. By this, I mean like the French public, they had a pretty strong distaste of paper money, in part because there was a paper money experiment less than a century earlier, in 1716 to 1720, with a John Law experiment. So you had like a Mississippi bubble, and they had this paper money experiment. That left a pretty bad taste in the public's mouth, basically. And for that reason, they really tried to distance the assignats from paper money per se. So the first assignats were really more of a debt instrument. They paid interest. They had coupon payments. You had to sign your name on the back to say, okay, you, you are the owner of these assignats. They were a very large denomination, about 10,000 pounds, which you, know, you could not use in regular transactions. But very quickly, people actually use those assignats to make transactions. And the way they did it is you had a bunch of intermediaries that developed. Uh, so municipal governments started uh, creating banks of issue and you also had private banks. And so you have this sort of like free banking, if you will, but the base money is not specie. It's this sort of debt obligation. You also had the coupon payments that would be used to make transactions. And so very quickly, the French government saw in this uh, seniorage opportunity, and that's when really the assignats uh, became paper money.
Okay, so the origins of the French Revolution were economic in terms of the big fiscal deficits, the debt they were accruing. You know, in preparing for the show, I went back and read some other papers in addition to yours. I read the um, Thomas Sargent, uh, Francois Veld paper, 1995, Journal of Political Economy. And they did an interesting comparison where they, they compared France to the UK or Great Britain and how you know they had fought, fought all these wars. France lost a bunch of them, went bankrupt multiple times. But the UK was successful of, of in terms of raising revenue during peace times to pay off the wartime, and the French couldn't do this. They they continue to struggle. So you you see this economic story building. I, I understand that. But but Louis, I guess my question to you is that you know this this revolution got pretty intense, right? I guess was it was at seventeen ninety three to ninety four was really the reign of terror. I mean, it was a lot of change lasted some time, as you mentioned. Was there more at work than just the economics? So, you know, you've had the Enlightenment. I mean, were people ready to get rid of feudalism? Because that that was one thing that they got rid of, right? Feudalism. They took the property, the church, nobility. Was there other forces at work beyond just pure economic ones? I mean, sure. I mean, a lot of people talk about the development of and that Enlightenment ideology, and that surely played a role. Of course, the causality can be reversed sometime, which is that once the revolution happened, they tried to find justifications for, sure. for uh, yes. making reforms. So if you yeah, take like that, somebody that like sense. Rousseau, his main book, like The Social Contract, was not especially popular. But then between uh, 1789 to 1799, you have more than 30 editions of that book. Um, so, yes, ideology played a role, but often it was kind of fluid um, and it, it, it was not necessarily predetermine what was going to happen, or at least it wasn't clear to the actors in 1789. With respect to all the economic aspects, one thing that is peculiar about the hyperinflation during the French Revolution is that it happens during a war, and most of the hyperinflation during the 20th century, let's say, happened after First World War, right? It happened after the war. Yeah. And so that's something that is peculiar to the French experience. Why did the French crown happen to be in such distress financially? Here you have multiple hypotheses. Some people talk about the American War of Independence. And of course, you have a lot of parallels between the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Other authors point to the fact that in the 1780s, just before the French Revolution, you had a bunch of conservative ministers that basically let deficit run. You even had one finance minister, Calon, who had a sort of like proto-Keynesian reasoning, which is, well, it, it's good for, for business to have some kind of spending by the court, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, that didn't end up doing very well. But uh, Now, as a Frenchman, Louis, I want to ask you this question. What does the French Revolution mean to a modern person living in France? Is it like July 4th for the, you know, the U.S. citizens? We celebrate, we get excited about it. What? What, what's the perspective you take on that? Well, I, I, I guess historically it, it is less consensual than July 4th in America because we went through okay. so many different regimes. After the French Revolution, you have the restoration of the monarchy. And so the French Revolution is seen in this kind of negative light. And it's really after 1870 and the uh, Third Republic that you have this effort on the part of historians to rehabilitate the revolution. And even then, you have a lot of different views with respect to what, what part of the revolution you are rehabilitating. Okay. Are you re rehabilitating basically the constitutional monarchy phase? Are you rehabilitating the terror? Is that just creates kind of a lot, a lot of political debates. Yeah. So because it went on so long and there's very different phases, some of them pretty violent, you don't maybe want to rehabilitate all of them, but certain parts of it. So, okay, very fascinating. And it was interesting to hear you talk about the influence of John Law still being in their minds. They want to avoid it. And something you guys mentioned, uh, Brian, that this was the first hyperinflation in Western Europe. So John Law's episode didn't create hyperinflation. It just created some inflation. What, what's, what, was, what would you say is the difference between his episode and, and this one? I'll just say real quick that we're here. We're using Kagan's definition of having inflation cross the threshold of at least fifty percent okay. per month or or higher. 
that is, of course, sort of an arbitrary line to draw in the sand because if you're experiencing 30% per month inflation, sure, you know, that's pretty bad too. So when we use this case, we're saying this is the first time in, in Western Europe outside of the 20th century that we get rates of price level increases that exceed 50% per month. Uh, there's some debate. I mean, this could actually be the first actual case of hyperinflation using Kagan's definition in human history. Now, we do a few centuries earlier in China – you do have a pretty large inflation occurs as well, but because of data limitations, we don't really know the actual extent to which there there was. But certainly, this is the first hyperinflation in in Western Europe using uh, that Kagan criteria. So the John Law episode had inflation, high inflation, but not hyperinflation at fifty percent. And how would the continental experience in the U.S. So we just, we had the revolution, U.S. Revolution, right before this one. And we have, you know, the U.S. Continentals, the famous saying, not worth the Continental. That was also pretty high inflation, too, but not quite the same as what we experienced in the French Revolution. The price increase of the French Revolution is about 11,000%. It's, it's quite high. I, it is quite higher than the experience with the Continentals as well. Okay. But, of course, you have really links between the two experiences because a lot of officers, for instance, had French officers that served during the American Revolution came back with a kind of same ideas. And if you look at the parliamentary debates during the French Revolution, often they justified certain economic policies on the ground that, well, the Americans did similar things. So for instance, when they established price controls, that was one of the things they said, like, well, look, even George Washington went in the countryside and purchased commodities at a heavy discount. The the two experiences are related in that way. So what you're saying, though, is the U.S. Revolutionary War was in the minds of the French during the revolution as well. Absolutely. Yes. You had strong influence between the two experiences. Well, one thing to add on to that, uh, another thing that that Louis and I found, and, and one of the things that motivated this paper was that the Confederate policymakers were then influenced by the French experience with hyperinflation when they sought to make their currency redeemable for gold after the war's end. So we do see this sort of reciprocity of of ideas that are emerging out of these experiences sort of cross-influencing policymakers in two countries across time. Now you guys know there's this this experience has a legacy both on like economic thought, you know, development of theories for inflation as well as just, you know, in a broader understanding of, of the French histories. Walk us through some of the the people who were influenced by, you know, this experience with hyperinflation. So, of course, here too, it's both ways, because one can think that, well, the Athenians were an asset-backed money, where the asset in question was land. Is that surprising from the countries that developed physiocracy, the the economic theories that, well, you know, agriculture is the main creator of value? I think there may have been some aspect of this when creating the Athenians. During the experience of the Athenian hyperinflation, a lot of people had in mind the quantity theory, but a very, very crude version of it. Like you double the quantity of money, you double prices. Yep. And so critiques of the quantity theory were like, look, we double the, the quantity of assignats and you have prices that have more than doubled. It's proves that it's, uh, for instance, greed or monopolists that take profit of, of what's happening and not you know, purely monetary factors. But after the French Revolution, you had a bunch of economists that started to say, like, well, look, when people expect inflation, velocity is going to, to, to increase quite, quite a bit. So the first one would be Henry Fonten uh, in England, who pointed that out. And in France, like Jean-Baptiste Say, who was young in the beginning of the French Revolution, but later on uh, participated in, in like, the Napoleonic regime. And he wrote his treatise on political economy. And that's what he says. It's like, look, if, if you, people expect inflation, then prices are mm-hmm. going to rise at a faster rate than just the rate of growth of the money supply because velocity is going to increase. Let's go to the specifics. And you've already provided an outline of it. But Brian, maybe why don't you provide us, what was the original idea behind the issuance of the uh, assignats and then the land sales. How was it supposed to operate? How did it actually operate? So uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll talk a little bit about how Louis and I started thinking about this, and then I'll let Louis turn over and go through the actual mechanism a little bit of how that worked. But 
One idea that we were influenced by when we were looking at this literature, the political economy of of hyperinflation, James Buchanan and uh, Jeff Brennan wrote this book called The Power to Tax in the, I think it's the late 1970s or early 1980s. And they have actually a chapter on the political economy of, of seniorage. And they're actually somewhat critical of the sort of standard approach to studying hyperinflation because they say, look, you're sort of assuming that the decision over how much money to create is being made by this sort of monolith, the government, rather than it emerging through a process of politicians interacting with one another, uh, or unless you can show that there was some rule guiding the the future path of policy, it seems sort of weird to think that there's going to be a stable money demand function. And that got Louis and I thinking, well, you know, hyperinflation usually occurs during periods of political instability, right? We don't have like w- well performing governments don't hyperinflate like right. that like those two things don't so normally what you have is political instability and hyperinflation and one way to think about political instability is that essentially the political property rights the decision rights over who's going to make decisions about policy in this case monetary policy are not clearly defined right they're up for grabs by by different people and as a result you get a lot of uncertainty about what the future path of monetary policy is going to look like. So if you're going to try to study these episodes, we need to account for the fact that as different interest groups gain or lose power over the policymaking uh, process, that is going to have an effect over monetary policy. And now in the case of the ASEAN, I'll I'll let Louis elaborate a bit more, but in the case of the ASEAN, it is uh, essentially, it's not redeemable in the sense that many economists, I think, would understand that term. It's not redeemable in the sense of say like a free bank note that was redeemable for gold at par on demand, right? That's that's one way to think about redeemability. Another way of thinking about redeemability is that at some point you could use this to exchange, uh, that you could use the note to purchase something, but it's not redeemable at a fixed par value, right? So like a free bank note is, is redeemable, is supposed to be redeemable at a fixed par value. Whereas the ASEAN, was actually used to purchase land sales, clergy land sales at first, at auction. What that meant, though, was that there, there was no fixed par value between the, the ASEAN and the value of the land because the, the, the actual sale price at auction determined the value. And you could either purchase the land using ASEANs or using specie. So it's a little bit different than your normal sort of redeemability argument of, like, say, redeemability under a gold standard. Now... The government's commitment to keep using land sales to redeem or to pull the ASEANs out of circulation is one way to think about how it controlled the future path of monetary policy. And when that commitment wavered to using the expropriated properties as a way of basically buying back the currency that it had issued, then you're essentially saying that, okay, monetary policy was going to grow like this. Now it's going to grow like that, right? Or I should say it's going to grow at this pace and now it's going to grow at a much higher pace. Well, then clearly that's going to have an expectation or that's going to have an effect on the demand uh, for money. But Louis, this on the specifics of this. So I, I, I think I vaguely understand the land sales were tied to the ASEAN. So there's supposed to be a, a link. This is where the asset backing occurs. What's not clear to me is how were they initially issued? What were they timed to go out just as land was being sold, before land's being sold, and then how do they get pulled out of circulation? So again, the issue was paying the creditors. So they gave people asking us, and they were not, as Ryan said, redeemable for land at a fixed rate. But instead, what happened is when in the future the land was auctioned. You usually had like a candle auction and, uh, you know, yeah. people bid money. They could bid with assignats or they could bid with gold. If they bid with assignats, then the state would get those assignats and burn them. Often in the public square so that it's obvious to everybody. And they did, did that really until the end. They, they continued to burn the assignats. When gold was used, they converted gold for assignats and then they would burn the assignats. So now, why would that pin down the value of the ASNIA? Well, if you think about a certain amount of ASNIA being issued, like maybe like 10,000 pounds, and the species value of the properties is at least as equal to this, then 
because the assignee is as good as good as gold to to use in auctions, then that just means the assignee is going to be traded at par. But if they issue more assignee than there is, you know, national assets, what was called national assets, that is those clergy goods, then that's when the assignee starts to depreciate. Even if there is no monetary use to the assignee, this mechanism would hold. In a way, it's like very akin to you know what is now known as the fiscal theory of the price level. It's a very it's, it's, it's an very, asset-backed uh, security. So yeah. So let you, me ask you, this you, question, Louis. Let me ask this question. Why did the recipients of the assignats believe and take it seriously? I mean, so the, the expectation was that there'd be land sales, it'd be tied to gold, at least the value indirectly. But why take the government seriously at all? I mean, this is a revolution. It's it's if anything, might be a time where you might question whether you would get your money back. But apparently that wasn't the case, right? They, they held their value relatively well. What, what do you think explains that? Sardin and Vell, for instance, like sections of French Revolution for the Assignats in three separate periods. The so first period is the early revolution. They issue the Assignats. They even have specific schedule with respect to the retirement of currencies. They, they say, for instance, like those 500 million, you have to retire within two years. Hmm. And that's when the assignee doesn't really lose value. Okay. Trades pretty close to par, even earns interest. So it's really a debt instrument. And then later on, like 1792 or so, starts to, to lose quite a bit of value. And when it starts losing too much value, that's when the government has all of these legal restrictions to boost the demand for assignees. So they prevent trading in gold. They prevent double pricing. So you have to price only in assignats. They introduce some price controls as well to prevent inflation. You had this view among some revolutionaries that, again, the depreciation of the assignat was due to his greed or those greedy farmers that would like hoard food, those greedy bankers that would hoard gold. And for that reason, they introduced a bunch of legal restrictions that way. Then they got lifted mostly in 1794 when Robespierre, you know, was toppled. And after a while, those restrictions went, went, went away. And uh, soon after, you start having hyperinflation. So early on, it was credible. It was a credible policy, at least initially. I mean, that, that's the key thing is, right? You believe that there would be some real value behind these assets that the government was issuing. But I have to add that they did continue to burn those assignats until the end. They, they did not renege on that, let's say, obligation. But it's the same question of why didn't they default? So like, really, it's a fiscal crisis, uh, the French Revolution, and bankruptcy was out of question. Maybe because the rentiers, uh, uh, bond holders, were simply too powerful of an interest group. You have to wait basically 1797 for uh, the French government to bankrupt on two-thirds of its debt. But they really resisted this tendency to default. There was this view that it was really bad. You shouldn't do bankruptcy. It was against uh, most of like the orthodox economists that served, for instance, in the National Assembly. If you take, for instance, uh, Dupont de Nemours, who is linked to America as well, because the Dupont Corporation mm. is uh, named after his son. Well, there was this view, bankruptcy is the last thing you want to do. If we do this, we are not going to be able to establish credibility to then do the things we want. It's just that, you know, after a few years of the revolution in 1797, they just couldn't do otherwise. And that's when they say have to default. And that's the last time, by the way, that France defaulted on its debt, uh, 1797. I was just going to add one of the things that we we discuss in the paper is that at least, as Louis mentioned, later on they do end up defaulting on the debt. But when we look at some of these political events that essentially portended the end of the Asiana or the government's commitment to use its assets to remove the Asiana from circulation, uh, we actually see bond prices go up. We see the bond prices appreciate. In other words, it does seem that uh, the bondholders were a relevant interest group that the government wanted to keep happy. And so if it was going to, if it, if it had to default on something, it wasn't going to default on its debt. It was going to default on its, its currency that it issued, which is actually another similarity to the American Revolution, mm. which is that the Americans, uh, we, uh, did, did default on the Continentals, uh, but did so 
uh, to make sure that we could pay our bondholders, many of whom were located outside of the United States. And you can understand why you would want to prioritize paying back your external creditors, especially if you're a new young nation. Uh, you need to make sure that you can borrow again if the need arises at some point uh, in the future. So like the Americans, uh, the French did prioritize the bondholders over the, the holders of the ASEANs. Even though, of course, prioritize doesn't mean they didn't suffer heavily from Sure, sure, sure. sure. And then default. Right? Relatively yeah. speaking. So yeah. so just to yeah. be clear, the years that the ASEANs were used were 1790 to 1796 or something? Yes, that's Okay. Correct. So you have that nice run there. And from 1790 up until 1792, as you mentioned, relatively stable real money demand. And then uh, 1792, the government decided to divorce the note issue from land sales. But you, you also mentioned they still do the, the burning of the notes that they're getting. Apparently, they're not burning enough notes. But then in 1793, I guess this is the other fascinating thing, reading for this, a new group comes to power. Maybe you can tell us about them. And they, they institute, I'm using quotes here, a guillotine-backed currency. <laughs> so ex- explain that kind of clever use of the words there. Why was there a guillotine-backed currency or guillotine-backed ASEANs? So that sentence comes from like uh, somebody who immigrated to to Switzerland who was an economist, Steve Renoir. And that's something he says. It's like you had this guillotine back currency. Why guillotine back? It's because one of the things they did is, for instance, expropriate the uh, nobles uh, later on. And this became part of the backing for the Asinias as well and increased it. In fact, when you have the goods, so the assets of the emigres, that is those who emigrated from France, usually nobles, they are confiscated. And so the backing of the Asinia increases and you see the Asinia reevaluate, like increase in value for a while before it starts declining again. So that's a clear case where the fiscal backing of the currency increase, you have reevaluation of the currency before it devaluates again once they issue more money and et cetera, et cetera. So in 1793, Louis, the, the Jacobins come to power, and I guess that's where I was going with this. What I read about them is they were very strict, very hardcore. The guillotine back currency was under them. I mean, were they threatening people like with, with punishment if they didn't accept the ASEANs? Was it more absolutely okay. now whether or not that punishment was effective? Uh, from what I can tell from, for instance, police reports, in Paris it was pretty effective uh, because they had pretty good control. Uh, political control over the city. In the countryside, that's uh, a lot less clear. Okay. The peasants usually did not like the Asnias, did not like to accept them. Uh, they saw them as a Parisian currency that was upon, uh, uh, imposed upon them that they could not necessarily use easy, that would depreciate f- fast. You know, they had probably lags between transactions that was quite long. So, so they didn't like the Asnia very much. So by the end of um, the hyperinflation episode, really the use of the Asinia becomes more centered around Paris because that's where the revolutionaries have the most control uh, over. Yeah, so that, that's what was fascinating, I guess, is the, the Jacobins were so brutal, so uh, rigid in their enforcement. It ha- actually helps the value. And I'm going to come back to this, but I'll just mention it now. It, it raises questions about the state you know, back theory of money. But I'm going to put a pin in that for now. So we, again, just to summarize, 1790, the ASEANs are introduced. It works relatively well until 1792 when the government divorces note issue from land sales. But in 1793, the Jacobins come in and they actually help restore some of the value to the ASEANs. And then they lose in 1794. Yeah, so I'll I'll jump in there. So we, we pick up in 1794 right after Robespierre is executed. So... Sergeant and Vell divide the the Asia uh, experience into sort of three different theories of the of of the demand for money, uh, and so it's that final period, the 1794 to 1796, that in their view is most consistent with the Kagan view of hyperinflation, and it's also during that period when you actually do get price level increases that meet that that threshold of of fifty percent per month. So we focus exclusively on that period. We do so for. Uh, for several reasons, one of which is that it's not obvious that the Kagan specification applies to situations of relatively mild 
uh, inflation. For those of you who are not familiar with the, that particular specification, Kagan's intuition here was that, well, when prices are increasing by at least 50% per month, we can sort of ignore real interest rates and, and, and real income or whatever scale variable you want to use for the demand for money because the rate of depreciation is just so large that any change in the real interest rate or any change in uh, real income is just going to have an inconsequential effect on the demand for money. And so uh, we focus exclusively on that period. And then we look at basically during that, that 1794 to 1796 period, there's a, there's a great deal of political instability around the strength of the Jacobins and their commitment, as you mentioned, David, to uh, enforcing the use of the ASEAN. And what we show is that as the, the strength of the Jacobins is weakened, the demand for the ASEAN falls. Because as you, as you mentioned, the Jacobins were committed to continuing using uh, this currency. But as they lost political power, that essentially is like a, a policy path shock. Mm. Uh, and so what's going to happen with the ASEAN is going to be different now than it, what it would have been had the Jacobins uh, remained in power. And so what we, we, the first thing we look for in the paper is, okay, well, can we identify structural breaks in the demand for money over this time period, this 1794 to 1796 time period? And we do, we identify uh, two, one in the summer of 1795 and then another in November uh, 1795. The first one corresponds to a weakening of the Jacobin left. And then the, the one in November of 1795 corresponds with the establishment of the directorial uh, regime, which basically meant the end of the pretended the end of the, the ASEAN. So what we do find, however, is that while there is a structural break in the in the demand for money in the, seven, the summer of 1795, we do have a stable money demand relationship between 1794 and 1795 despite that break. In other words, there is an inverse relationship between real ASEAN balances and inflation. However, after set November 1795, that relationship breaks down entirely. Uh, in other words, I think the only demand that was left for the ASEAN was sort of a speculative demand that, well, maybe maybe the government will honor these, maybe they won't. But it, we have a figure in the paper, for those of you that want to go look at it, where we, we actually show you know what the three different money demand functions look like. And what you see is essentially no relationship whatsoever between real ASEAN balances and the inflation rate after uh, November 1795. The first structural break is really, it's like, so Robespierre is top of, doesn't necessarily mean at first that uh, the Jacobins are like uh, losing power because it's kind of an internal strife within the Jacobin faction. But then it's clearer and clearer that more moderates are getting this position back, that there is going to, to be some constitutional change. And you have a bunch of insurrections in Paris that happen. And each one of them, they really just weaken the Jacobins because they lose. So the one that is closest to our first structural break, for instance, you have this three or four day insurrection in Paris with like tens of thousands of people that barricade, they even like take a cannon, they storm the National Assembly, kill one of their members, like put their head on a spike, present it to the president of the assembly. It's a pretty violent affair. And one of their slogans was, Asliat at par. Right. So that was like, the, the Jacobins were like, we need to do anything possible to bring up the value of the Asnia. Often, again, with quite crude quantity theory reasonings, so it's like we need to retire the currency by, for instance, uh, you know, issuing that, which when they tried to do this didn't really work, which you should expect from the point of view of, let's say, you know, an asset backed currency kind of mechanism. But, but then again, when they lose, more and more, you have more questioning on the part of politicians. They're like, well, maybe we should get rid of the Asinias. Maybe we should not honor them anymore. And that's really when the, the hyperinflation occurs, when the demand for Asinias just completely collapses and uh, you start having like quite a few problems financing even government expenditures through inflation. So the breakdown occurs as the one group that really supports the ASEANs loses power, kind of follows that increasingly. And you mentioned two big events in particular, the summer and the fall. So what we have here is, is a development with the one group that really supports the ASEANs begins to lose power. And there's some big changes in the summertime and then later in November. And so you see that this idea that this asset that you're holding, the ASEAN, 
the future backing of it is in question increasingly. So it loses value, inflation takes off, you go to hyperinflation. So it's a very fascinating story, and, and we'll let the l- listeners go look at your paper for more details. But let's let's move from the specifics of the story to the implications for how we understand theories of the price level. So one of the ones that we've touched on is fiscal theory, the price level, the, you know, and that says the current price level is equal to the expected, you know, discounted value of future primary surpluses. So some kind of backing in the future, real resource backing for uh, the the government liabilities you're holding today. Another theory we keep touching on is a sophisticated version of the quantity theory, very forward looking the quantity of government liabilities or notes outstanding. So where do you guys land on this? Is, is it a, is, does this experience confirm one or the other or some of both? What, what do you think? Brian, I'll start with you. So my thought is that it's a, a, a bit of both. And I think that what you see in the, in the figure in the paper where we break down what we identify are three money demand relationships is that given some policy path, you get an inverse relationship between inflation and real balances that I see is sort of like kind of the basic quantity theory intuition. Uh, However, when that policy path changes for whatever reason, then you start to see the money demand function move around quite a bit. So I think the paper illustrates both if you want to call it asset backing or fiscal back. I I, I see a a, a nuanced distinction between the two theories, but either way, if, you know, you, on the one hand, you have this asset or fiscal backing theory. On the other hand, you have this quantity theory. I think the paper sheds light on both that the asset part of this sort of pins down the policy path. But then within that policy path, we have an inverse relationship between real balances and inflation. And so I see the paper as, as sort of contributing to, to both saying that there's both elements uh, play a role. So just to be clear, the, the quantity theory is kind of like a local maximum, and then the, the asset back to more of a global max. It's like the, the, the overall trajectory of the price level is being set by the asset back. But within that, there's, there's certain changes driven by the quantity approach. Is that right? That's how I interpret it. Now, I think, again, you could take sort of a sophisticated version of the quantity theory from someone like Bennett McCallum, right? And there you would you would actually get... It, 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 none of this is inconsistent with the quantity theory, right? Because it, it would all be about, okay, so what are, what's the expectation of the future monetary policy path? Pol- as the expectation of that policy path varies, then you get different money demand functions. That's totally consistent with that version of the, of the quantity theory. I mean, I think sometimes some of these sociology of science is such that we like get these like different schools and terms and whatever. And we, and we don't necessarily, sometimes we talk at like cross purposes. So, you know, if you want to call that sort of like a, as you described it, the, you know, the global Mac, you know, the global situation is pinned down by the asset backing, but then within that we get the quantity theory variation, or you could take a big broad picture of the quantity theory, which is probably closer to my own view. The future path of policy determines the demand for money. And so as that future policy path changes, so too does the, demand for money okay and of course we should like be aware that part of the reason you may have that shift is you know people find substitutes <laughs> it, it, either they go to barter or they they find substitutes to as a way to make exchanges and so that's probably why we find those shifts and and that's part of the debate also for like the continentals and the uh, asset-backed monies in the u.s is like well you know, maybe it's not inconsistent with the quantity theory once we allow for outflow and inflows of gold into the country. And and and, and you did have very little specie until fairly late during the French Revolution. But of course, toward like 1796 or so, you start having more specie, at least in the countryside, being used because the assignments are just a total disaster at that point. So those are the theories for the price level. So we we you know, in one category we we can put uh, the asset backed or fiscal theory of the price level. And as Brian said, there's maybe some slight differences between those two. But then generally speaking, there's some real resource backing the money. Then there's the quantity theory in the other bucket. And so we've we used those two to think about the price level. But I want to step aside now and talk about theories for money itself. Why do people accept money? And I think the ASEANCE is an interesting case study, right? So you you have on one hand, you can have the state 
theory people, the, the charts are list, the people who say, you know, money only becomes accepted because the government's backing it, or there's a threat of force, or there's they take taxes in it. Then you get more of the Carl Minger kind of money emerges organically through market process, through discovery. And it, it strikes me, at least, that the ASEANs tend to support the state theory more, but maybe I'm wrong. Definitely with, with the Jacobins, it seems to be very state theory, the, the, threat, the, the threat of force. But how would you view this? Where, where would you come down on, on those two theories? Well, of course, by... 1792 and the Jacobins and this kind of very heavy-handed interventions, the, the Asinians were already used as money fairly widely. I, I'm not exactly sure they intended to create a money. Again, the first Asinians were more debt securities. You mm-hmm. had to write your name on the back. They, it, it, it was just not really considered as a money at all. And there is an element of spontaneity in the sense that you have all of those intermediaries that just issue nodes that are redeemable for assignats and that are, that are smaller denomination. One thing that people need to realize is that during the beginning of the French Revolution, a lot of the gold either goes abroad or goes underground. You have People are fairly scared. You have this, this thing that is called the great fear in the countryside. There's this idea that, you know, you have like roving bandits that come and is going, are going to steal everything from you. And so you have a lack of currency to make transactions. So they try to find a substitute. And that's really when the Asinia also kind of takes the place of gold. So I, I'm not exactly sure it, it supports the state theory of, of money. Uh, again, because at least at the very beginning, I'm not sure they were intended as being as widely circulating as they were. So that's yes. Okay. Brian, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll add on a little bit to that. So I, I, the way I interpret sort of the charterless view versus the Mengarian view is we're trying to explain the social origin yeah. of the institution of, of money. Now, clearly, you know, by the time of the French Revolution, humans have figured out money. <laughs> uh, and so... Uh, so in that sense, I don't I, I don't know anyone who is sort of an inherent to the Mengarian view of which I would consider myself would would deny the fact that if a government wants to compel people to use a certain thing as money, that it certainly can. Uh, there's plenty of evidence of that being the case. But I don't necessarily think that that is that the French experience says, oh, well, this tells us that the Mengarian view is wrong. I mean, one one way to to, to argue this would be to say, well, they only had the idea of money because money spontaneously emerged in the first place. And they realized, oh, wow, a circulating medium can be valuable because it reduces transaction costs. Why don't we monopolize the creation of that circulating medium and reap the, the profits that come from doing so? So I don't, I don't necessarily think that the, um, the French experience with the ASEAN is, runs counter to the Mangarian logic. I, what I do think it illustrates, though, is you know, fiat money has this sort of final period problem of, you know, who, you know, if, if at some point you think that the money, you know, even if it's a thousand years from now, right, if a thousand years from now, someone's not going to be willing to accept the U.S. dollar. If you take uh, rational expectations seriously, then then the dollar should lose value today, right, because of backwards induction. And so in order to get a new currency off the ground, you have to do something to to convince people that there's going to be, we have this phrase in the paper, a buyer of last resort. Somebody has to be willing to step in, whether that's the government or, or maybe a, a central bank on the on the behalf of the government, that is willing to step in and buy back the currency that it issued in order to in order to solve this sort of final period problem. And I think the ASEAN is kind of a is a creative way to solve this problem because historically, one way to solve that problem is that you make your notes redeemable for specie, you know, gold or or silver. Uh, but rather than doing that, the Asiats solve the final period problem by by say, essentially saying, well, we're going to steal this group's property <laughs> and then we're going to have auctions where you can purchase that property using the notes that we just issued. And that also can solve this final period problem of, of fiat money. So I think that the ASEAN has a lot to teach those of us that are interested in, in monetary economics and monetary history because it illustrates a lot of these very high level ideas that that people who are engaged in high theory, of, of which I'm definitely not one, that think about why why is fiat money accepted? Why does it have value? Things like that. The ASEAN experience can help us think through how real world governments or real world uh, people have, have tried to solve this, this problem. 
In the time we have left, I want to bring up Napoleon. There's a movie coming out in the fall, so listeners will have heard the show by the time the movie comes out. But it looks really great, big budget movie. And I'm just wondering, Louis, where does Napoleon fit into the story? What was his views of the ASEAN, and did his wars have a bearing on the ASEANs? Well, that's a great question. Uh, well, I, I've seen all these a trailer. I'm 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 skeptical, but I, I will I will wait for the the movie to comment on it. But uh, if I can just jump in real quick, I saw the trailer and I texted Louis and said, this looks fantastic. And Louis responded with a litany of historical inaccuracies <laughs> just in the trailer. Uh, so we'll see. But to be fair, I don't know. Maybe it's just an artifact of being a trailer and it, everything is not in order and everything. Yeah. But of course, Napoleon, uh, at the end of the Assignat, was a general in Italy. He was doing his first campaign of Italy. He had trouble, actually, because of the Assignats, uh, because you had to feed the troops and pay them. And paying them when you have hyperinflation is, is pretty tough, hmm. uh, especially because in occupied territories, peasants and, and people were not thrilled in accepting Assignats that were devaluing very, very fast. So he was very critical of the Assignats. Okay. You are even like... Uh, uh, an historical recollection by one of these bankers who would become the uh, founder of the Bank of France, Le Couteux, who recollects how he had a dinner in Paris, Napoleon, and Napoleon was like, we should get rid of the Assignats right now, like, do away with this and go back to gold. And, you know, Le Couteux and other bankers were like pretty wary of this. They were like, well, we shouldn't do this immediately because going back to species is going to take some time. Species is not there. Species is abroad. And if we get rid of the Asinia right now, we have nothing to make transaction and it's a problem. So he was pretty critical of paper money. After after the end of the Asinia, you have this period where like France is kind of in limbo and, and they allow this sort of free banking experiment in the sense that you have multiple banks of issue, mostly in Paris, of course, that redeem their notes for uh, gold. A lot of those bank of issues, you had to be a shareholder to have access to the discount window. So you had some, some, some interesting sort of like industrial organization of banking. Uh, and, and Napoleon, when he, he, he comes into power, one of the first thing he does is to create the Bank of France. So you have two bankers at Perigo and Le Couteau uh, that just come. And, lobby Napoleon for that Bank of France, if you will. And after a while, Napoleon was a major shareholder of the Bank of France, and he never used it too heavily when it comes to financing okay. in his own wars, even though he, he tried sometimes, hmm. right? He tried to have more and more control of his Bank of France as the war went on to you know, finance his expenditures in his very, very expensive uh, wars abroad. But there was never really, you know, any kind of very heavy inflation. It was actually much lower than the inflation in England during the Napoleonic War, right? In England, during the Napoleonic Wars, you have inflation that goes quite high. The so price double, the so price level more than doubles. That is not the case in France. So, so yes. Well, thank you, Louis, for that, that history of Napoleon. And I did not know that he was the reason we have a central bank in France, at least before the Euro, the Bank of France, he was the creator of that. You won't get that in the movie, I bet. So you heard it here on the podcast. <laughs> That's why I'm skeptical of the movie. <laughs> well, nobody cares who starts the central bank of France other than listeners of this show. But hats off to Napoleon for his legacy beyond just fighting battles. He actually started a central bank very fast. Yeah, and his entire family also. But like, uh, 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 not his entire, but even his mother was a shareholder of the Bank of France. So you okay. had quite, quite a few <laughs> political connections at the time. Very interesting. Well, with that, our time is up today. Our guests have been Brian Kutzinger and Louis Wanad. We thank you both for coming on the show. We will have your paper posted in the show notes so listeners check it out. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. 
This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings.